Hey, I have the, uh, the great privilege. We've got a couple friends in town tonight, friends of Veritas, friends of The Crossing, uh, Sean Boone and Nathan Arnold from The Bridge, uh, North County Church in Ferguson. Um, we get the pleasure of hearing from Sean Boone tonight. These guys have been friends of our church. Uh, they're doing amazing work uh, there in Ferguson. Um, they'll stick around later if, if you'd love to, to meet them, connect with them. They'll be out in the foyer. They'd love to get to know you um, and would be happy to share all that God is doing in and through their church plant, in and through uh, their ministry, in and through, um, yeah, their, their church there in Ferguson and in North County. And so, Boone, uh, if you want to come on up, uh, if you guys want to give Boone a round of applause, I will hand it over to him. What's up, Veritas? Come on, a little bit better. What's up, Veritas? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. My name is Boone. I'm one of the pastors at the Bridge North County in Ferguson. We gather right in the heart of downtown Ferguson. Anybody here heard of a town called Ferguson? Any, any, some people? We have a few people heard of Ferguson? Okay. Well, Glay, I'm, I'm so grateful and glad to have this opportunity to be with you all. First, I just want to say, like, I am super impressed to see so many college-age students gathering together on a Tuesday night to hear about Jesus. Wow. Come on, give yourselves a hand for that. Give Veritas staff and team a hand for making this environment so accessible for y'all. I'm impressed. Mainly because when I was your age, right, and I'm assuming that, by the way, Kate, when you said that you were talking to someone that was old and you think they were 50, I just want you to know I'm 49 and I'm still feeling pretty spiffy in here, okay? Just, just throwing that out there for free, right? That was hilarious. Me and Nathan looked at each other and both fell out laughing when she said that. I was like, oh, I guess they don't know they got an almost 50-year-old guy hitting the stage a little bit later. But anyways, uh, but when I was your age, by the time I was 18, as a matter of fact, I had already had two kids out of wedlock, first one at 15, second one at 18. I was already a convicted felon. I was already years into my addiction to the game. So that's sex, drugs, and violence. So by the time I was your age on a Tuesday night, the last place I would be would be in a room like this. And for me to have this opportunity to just share with y'all just gives me so much joy. And I am thrilled to have the opportunity over the next 20 or 30 minutes to share with y'all a little bit. Another reason why I'm so excited and so encouraged is because I realize now more than ever that people in your very age demographic are leaving the church, leaving Christianity, leaving anything with any sort of organizational standards to it in a, like religion. You're leaving that just hands down. And I know there's a lot of reasons why that's taking place. I understand why that's taking place for a lot of people. And so that's another reason why I'm excited to be here with you all tonight. And then on top of that, I know that there are many people in this room who are going to leave in the next four years, and you're going to be in different places, maybe different towns, maybe different states, and you all will be leading people in some capacity, whether it's at your family, whether it's in the church, whether it's at work, or wherever that may be. And so for me to have the opportunity to speak to so many future leaders just humbles me. And so first, I'm going to give you all a free one, because if, if, if I do this, I would feel like I've done a halfway decent job as a, a public speaker today. So where I come from, every now and then, I'll say something that people can agree with, and then they'll respond by saying, who can guess? Okay, so right now, this is y'all free one. Everybody just say amen. Just get it out. Just let it out right now. Just, just give me a real hearty amen. Okay, all right. Now I feel like I don't have to work as long. <laughs> now, so for me, when I first became a follower of Jesus, I was fortunate. I came into a church that specifically had a ministry that was welcoming 
ex-offenders like me into the life of the church. It was called Unshackled. And in that ministry, they carved out a space for guys and girls like me who were heavy, heavily involved in the gang culture and the gang activity of the late 80s, early 90s, when there was this huge crack epidemic in every urban center in America. And I was a part of that, victim to that, and also a perpetrator of that as well. But I came into the church, and fortunately for me, I landed and I had an absolutely amazing, faithful, patient leader. There was a man who loved his wife well, who led his church with integrity, that was patient and took the time to do life with people just like me. And so my early introduction into the church was in an environment and in a space where the leaders there were people that I could actually put my trust in. And I actually did. I actually put my trust in people who I really didn't know a whole lot about. But some of the things that I was able to find out really quickly was most of the people that I was doing life with at that time actually believed what they were telling me. They actually believed what they were preaching. And so I know today it's extremely different because today it is becoming more and more difficult for us, for all of us, to trust, to put our faith and confidence in leadership. Now, it doesn't matter where that takes place at. It can be leaders of higher education, it's leaders in our political realm, and it's leaders even in the church. But the problem with the church is we are the group that claims, we're the ones that claims to have the literal words of God to guide us and oftentimes, it is us, those who are professing to be followers of Christ, those who are actually leaders in the church and other religious institutions, we fail miserably at living up to and out of the very standards that we say are not only true and good, but we say that they have the ultimate truth and what's eternally good. And so we are the ones who are professing and proclaiming to have the words of life, the words of truth, and we're claiming that we know what the end of the story is going to look like. And so when we fail as leaders, it just hits different. Amen to that? Amen, Amen to that. And so today we'll be talking about this Jesus, and you've been in this series, we've been in this series here about Jesus being unfiltered. And so when I think about Jesus unfiltered, a lot of things come to my mind. A lot of things go through my mind. First thing I can think about is when I was a kid coming out of the hood, leaving game culture, leaving the game, I needed to give a, I needed to get to a Jesus that was real. I needed to get to a Jesus that could transform. And I needed to get to a Jesus that made sense to me. And so I needed to find a way to do the hard work that a lot of you all are doing is to see through all of the filters or better yet to hear through all of the filters because if you're like me you've probably been presented a version of Jesus that is probably not somebody that you would really like to rock with and I, be I believe that what the Jesus we see in the story of scripture is a Jesus that is in fact a leader that is worth following a leader that's worth modern, a leader that's worth emulating. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of our time today. And before I get to the text, I'm in Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 32. I want to ask this question together. Is Jesus a leader worth following? So let's cut through all of the chase because we can have our ideas about, about church. We can have our ideas about religion. We can have our ideas about those who lead in Veritas and those who pastor this great church. But when it comes down to it, we are all claiming to be followers of Jesus. And what you need to know and what I need to know is, is this Jesus a leader that's worth following? Is this a Jesus that's worth us giving our life to. So let's just read what Mark says, and it's just a few verses, and I'm so glad I only have a few verses uh, to read. And in Mark chapter 9, verses 9, I mean, Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 32, they went on from there, 
and pass through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. Verse 31, for he was teaching his disciples. So here's this Jesus traveling with his followers, his disciples, those who had committed to following him. He was with his followers, and he was teaching them. And this is what it says in the, the other half, the second half of verse 31. He says this to them. Imagine your leader, your leader telling you this. He says, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, get this, this is probably what made all of them a little like, man, I don't know about this Jesus cat. He sound like he tripping, but okay, we, we, we've, we've committed to following him this far. Right? We've quit our jobs, and we've done all of these things, and we've fallen this far. But then he says, and after three days, he will rise. And it's clear what happens next in the story, verse 32. But they didn't understand the same. And they were afraid to ask him. And so here we see in this story, that what, what, uh, this part of the story, as Mark was writing this to the early Christians, to the early church, and he was telling them, retelling the story about Jesus, he put this in here, and he let them know that the same Jesus that we've all committed our lives to, when I say we all, I'm talking about those who have publicly professed their faith in Jesus Christ, so maybe I shouldn't say we all, I should say I, this Jesus that I, some of us, has put our faith into, they have him saying this. He was teaching his disciples, those that were, <laughs> that were following him, and they didn't understand. They didn't understand exactly what they were committing to. They didn't understand exactly what he was talking about and what that actually meant. But one thing was clear to them, in the midst of all of this, they still considered him to be a leader that was worth following. And so we want to know a little bit about why would these men consider this guy to be a leader worth following, and he's talking, and half the time he's talking, they don't know what the heck he's talking about. And so asking a question, and, we'll, and I'll answer this question. Hopefully I have two observations I want to make from this part of God's story. Is Jesus a, worth, a leader worth following? following. And the first observation I want to make in this text is Jesus was a leader. And I believe this is true about all leaders that's worth following. He's a leader who safely welcomes our skepticism. See, I don't know about you all, but when I first came into the church, all of my struggles and all of my skepticisms was always greeted with, don't question God. God knows best. Just have more faith. Just trust in the process. It's all going to work out for your good. But in all the ways that I was realistically struggling with the real hard questions, like how can this holy God really embrace a guy like me that have spent most of my life to terrorize in my own communities. How could this Jesus be willing to welcome me in when I was a guy that sold drugs to my own family members? And so I was struggling. I had skepticism. But thankfully to God, I found that Jesus, though I didn't understand it a lot, just like they did, I didn't understand what the heck was going on. I didn't understand half of what they were saying on the stage. I didn't understand most of the music. I didn't understand a lot of those things. But I still found Jesus interesting and safe enough for me to be willing to follow. Right here in verse number 31 and 32, we see it again, just really quickly, looking at what the text says. It says, he was teaching his disciples, we see this, he was saying to them, and he gave them this, this whole speech. He kind of gave them his, his purpose statement, right? He's like, this is what's gonna happen to me. I'm gonna be delivered, they're gonna kill me, but don't sweat it, I'm gonna rise again in three days, right? But they did not understand. And they were afraid to ask. But guess what? 
Jesus knew that. He knew what was going on in their hearts. He knew that they were struggling with what he was saying. He knew they were skeptical about what he was saying, but he still welcomed them to continue to follow him faithfully, but yet imperfectly. And so we have the same invitation to know that, that we are invited to follow a leader that actually safely welcomes our skepticism. And so we have the opportunity to present to others this Jesus who welcomes in safety their skepticism. And so whatever, what about this question that they have? Whatever, what about this question that you may be struggling with right now? Whatever you may be skeptical about the faith, about the church, about Veritas, about Jesus, you need to know that your skepticism is not only welcome with Jesus, but it's welcome with those who claim to follow him. Well, there we go. Woo! It's time for the benediction, y'all. I got a, I got an unsolicited amen. <laughs> Praise God. I'm happy. That. Thank you. I appreciate that. But Jesus is this leader who safely welcomes our skepticism. And I think that is, that is different than the Jesus that is oftentimes portrayed by those who profess to be Christians. Because if we're being honest, most of the time people are are portraying Jesus as the person that always is saying no too much. Don't do that. Don't go here. Don't watch that. Don't click that. Don't drink that. Don't taste that. Don't, 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 don't. And so people have this idea that Jesus is possibly, it's impossible for Jesus to welcome a person like me because I have too many questions. I'm struggling with too many things. And I am overly skeptical about the faith. And I'm so glad that we here in this part of God's story, we get this glimpse of a Jesus who's telling his followers some very hard things, probably the most imp- some of the most important stuff he had said to them at that point, and they didn't understand. And they were afraid to let him know that they didn't understand. But Jesus continued to love them, to lead them, and ultimately to lay down his life for them. It is Deepak Chopur who says this, and I believe this is a quote that really helps us illustrate the importance of being able to safely engage with our questions and with our struggles. And this is what he says. This is what uh, Deepak says. He says, in a relationship, the ability to be honest with each other about doubts and skepticism is crucial for growth and deepening trust. Only when we feel safe to express our concerns and fears can we navigate through them together and to create a stronger bond. And so here's what these, what this basically what Deepak is saying. He's saying that in order for us to fully grow in whatever area we're attempting to grow in, one of the key ingredients is for us to have a safe environment or a safe space to process our fears, our struggles, and our skepticism. And we see that when following Jesus, we are actually committing to following a leader who safely welcomes our skepticism. And I know that uh, for, for you, and if you're like me, you've probably always longed for relationships that can provide you both that safety and that acceptance. You all, if you're like me, long for a place where you can be honest about your skepticism, where you can push back, where you can ask questions and you can receive the help and the information you need. But have you ever considered, just, just considered, have you ever considered this profound, impact of Jesus' sacrificial love where he sacrifices, we receive his benefits, and we're able to do that in every step of our journey. And so it's not when we get it all together, when we figure it all out, when we have all of the answers, when, we, when, we can, when we're comfortable standing up and praying and leading the small group. It's not when that happens, but Jesus is safely welcoming you right now to take another step. And he is aware of your skepticism. Rather, you have been confident enough to voice it or articulate it with him or with anyone else. And I don't know about you all, but for me, that is a leader that is worth following. 
The second, sacri- uh, the second observation is not only is this, he this leader that safely welcomes our skepticism, but he's also a leader who sacrifices himself for others. So to have this safe place to process is good. But what's even better is for the person not only to welcome us safely to bring our skepticism, to be honest about our struggles, to be honest about our questions and our doubts, but he is also the one who is going to ultimately be the one who makes the sacrifice for you. And so that's very different than the Jesus that was presented to me when I was a child in Sunday school. It was always, once I got myself together, once I got my stuff in order, then and only then will I actually find a place to belong in God's family. Only then will I find myself a place to belong at the table with other believers. But here we see something uniquely different. It is Jesus who not only safely welcomes welcomes us with our skepticism, but it's him also who sacrifices himself for you and for me. In verse 31 and 32, again, at the end of verse 32, I mean, at the end, at the end of verse number 31, he says, and they will kill me. And, he w- and then he says, and I will rise. And so right here, he's letting them know that even though they are struggling, even though they're skeptical, even though they don't even understand what he's talking about, he's already letting them know that I am going to sacrifice myself and die for you. Not when you get yourself together, not after you figure it all out, not after you can properly answer all of my questions, but I am willing to go to the cross for you right now, and I know that you don't Get it all the way. And that's so encouraging for you. That is so encouraging for me. It was so encouraging for me, for me when I was leaving the game, when I was leaving the hood, when I was leaving the gang activity. And it's still what I go to each and every day as I still struggle. And I still, after 20 years of following Jesus faithfully but imperfectly, I still have my own skepticism. And so for you to know that with your skepticism and with your struggles, that Jesus is still willing to sacrifice himself. He's still willing to allow himself to be killed. And he does this in a way that's willingly, not sheepishly. He does this willingly, knowing the cost, knowing the pain, knowing the shame. He does this willingly, knowing that the very men that were with him when he was having this conversation were going to run off with their tails tucked and they were going to be deathly afraid when he was going to be arrested and going to be crucified. And he still willingly went to the cross and sacrificed himself for others. As a matter of fact, for the very people who were stringing him up, executing him publicly, stripped of all his clothing, beat and spit upon, on that moment when he had the opportunity to cry out to help for his heavenly father, what he says is something that I still am grateful for, but I'm still struggling with because I know that is not something that I could have said if I was in his shoes. He says to them, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He knew that they really didn't know. Just like he knew in this story, as he was leading his followers, as he was with his disciples, the guys he eat with, the guys he ate with, the guys he prayed with, the guys he cried, cried with, all of this stuff, they still didn't get him and they didn't get his message. But yet, he still welcomed them to be a part of his team. It was, I believe, January of 2012. There was a, a lady who had committed her life to going to the hardest places in the world and care for some of the most vulnerable people in some of the hardest places. This young lady, around 30 years old, 30, 31, 32 years old, found herself in a war-torn um, Somalia on the tail end of a really bad famine and she was there trying to 
give and provide humanitarian aid to the young people, especially that were struggling with all of the poverty, all of the famine, and all of the war. Anyways, during her trip, while she had committed her life to helping other people far away from home, in a country far away, in a place that was war-torn, in a place that wasn't safe, in a place that, that was ex experiencing an extreme famine, she found herself to be kidnapped by some Somalian pirates. And so during this time, she was kidnapped, her and a co-worker, and she was trapped with them. She was a hostage with them for over 90 days, over three months. Here's this young Anglo girl who moved, woman, I'm sorry, who moved over there to commit her life to doing something good, something positive, trying to make a difference. And that's what we all want, right? We all want to, we all want to know how are we going to make a difference in life? How are we going to make a difference in this world? And here she had it all figured out. She knew what she was called to do. She knew what she was called to be and what she was supposed to do. And she went out for it and she did it and she found herself a hostage. And when she was starving to death, extremely sick, didn't know if she was going to make it, assumed that any day now is going to be our last day. And it was so sad because for her, and I say this, and I say this cautiously and carefully, and I hope this, I hope it lands well with you all, but she thought it to be merciful if they would have just killed her without raping her first. That's what she thought. She's like... I she, that was the merciful thing that could, the best thing that could happen to her in her mind was that they would just shoot her in the head without raping her. And so she can go out peacefully. That's what she thought. But on this night, January 25th, tw in 2012, the Navy SEAL Team 6 is what it's called, under the direction of the President of the United States, they sent this team over to Somalia to rescue her and her co-worker. In the midst of this rescue, they come in in the middle of the night, and it's just like you would expect in a movie. She says she looks up, all she sees is black. She sees black ski masks. She sees black sky. She hears gunfire. She sees guys with guns, but she recognized that the accents of the people who were there rescuing were, 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 were American, and she realized that it was, at some point, it was the Americans sent the military to come and rescue her. And as she was running through the night, running for the rescue, they had to rendezvous to a safe place where they can be extracted by a helicopter. And in that moment, there was some rustling. In that moment, there was some noise. In that moment, SEAL Team 6 thought that the enemy was encroaching upon her, and she said something uniquely happened in that moment. She said that they all laid her on the ground, forming a circle around her, and they put themselves over her to protect her as a human shield. And she knew that she was safe, and she knew, and they communicated to her that they were willing to take a bullet, and they were willing to die for her. So she ultimately was safely rescued. And I love one of her quotes. This is um, what, what she said. Life's most challenging moments often reveal the incredible strength we never knew we possessed. <laughs> and so here's what's crazy about that. Like, right, she was rescued, right? But she had hope and faith, and she was willing to endure, and that's where her, her strength. And then she goes on to say, my rescue by SEAL Team 6 was not just an act of bravery. She refused to see it as simple, simply men and women in the military just doing their jobs, and they're just a few of the proud and the brave. But she goes on to say something else. She says it's not just an act of bravery, but a testament to the power of hope and the unwavering dedication to saving lives. It reminded me that even in the darkest of times, there are heroes who will risk everything to bring light back into our lives. What I love about that convert, well, about that, that, that last part of that quote is that, uh, that there, there are heroes who will risk everything to bring light back into our lives. And 
How much more do we see this illustrated for us and pointed out plainly in this part of God's story when Jesus is telling some of his closest followers who clearly don't get what he's saying and he's letting them know that I will die and it's coming up and I'm going to do it with you in mind. How much more are we reminded of the heroic acts every day we're invited to participate in anytime we're willing to leverage our voice, our influence to point others to the hope that is found only in Jesus. And so as we think about this, we think about, okay, it's, it's, it's cool, but when I hear you saying it, and it, and it sounds no different than any other message I've ever heard, and, and I get it, and, and I can feel it, but what does this mean for me? How am I supposed to take this back on campus? What does that look like for me in my everyday life? How is this going to matter tomorrow and Friday night or Saturday night or when I get a text or when I get ghosted by a friend or when I find out something bad is going on with my family at home or whatever the case may be? How am I supposed to take this and actually apply it to my life? And I think that I'm, I have four ways that I think that we can consider responding to this. Now, I want to be careful and say that these things that I'm about to say now aren't going to make you a better Christian. It's not going to make God love you any better. And it's not going to make your life necessarily any easier. Right? And so I want to make sure I say that. But I think these are still ways we ought to consider responding. And the first thing I think is important for us to do is to develop an ability to Reflect, And I think reflection is key. Reflection not only on what we learn from this passage, but reflecting over our own stories and our own lives. And we can begin to see those moments when heroes showed up for us. We can remember the moments when a person uh, embraced you or welcomed you in a class or a teacher took the time out or a, a family member invited you over. But more importantly, we're reminded to reflect on what Christ is teaching us in this word. So another thing we need to do is not just reflection. Another thing is discussion. We need to figure out how can we openly, honestly, and safely have these discussions with humility and open minds where we can share our own skepticisms, our own struggles, and community with other people. And then finally, not finally, then the third thing is, so we go from reflection to discussion to dependence. We need to figure out how in the world are we going to be able to trust God's plans even when we don't fully understand them. Because that's what we see these disciples constantly willing to take that next step with Jesus and constantly willing to follow him even when they don't totally understand. And that's a great reminder for you, and it's a great reminder for me, is that I'm encouraged and invited to take another step without fully understanding. Okay, y'all, I'm out of time. And the the last thing is surrender. And we need to figure out how do we constantly emphasize the significance of Jesus and his sacrificial death and his resurrection and what that means to us, what that means to me as a person as a father, as a husband, what that means for, for you. All right, y'all, I'm in my, I'm, I'm in my conclusion. I'm over the time. My, my timer has already went off. As the praise team comes back up, I'm going to really date myself, Kate. Um, I'm going to show, show, show you my age for real. There's a, a movie way back in the day called uh, The Dark Knight. Anybody remember the movie The Dark Knight? Batman movie? I know it's old school. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, the thing I, I love about that, that story is at the end, of, uh, not the end of that movie, but I love about the story how it is when Harvey Dent, who is a guy who is fighting for the integrity of Gotham, he's not willing to cut corners. He's only going to follow the law to its to its letter. He's beefing with Batman because Batman got his vigilante justice and he wants everything to happen the right way. And so here's this guy who is considered the white knight of Gotham. Here's this Harvey Dent guy, this this leader who's making, who's kicking butt and taking names, who's he's fighting crime all over the place. And then all of a sudden something drastic 
happens to Harvey Dent, the love of his life is killed. And during this explosion, he's forever disfigured and he goes on and he does some crazy stuff. If y'all have seen the movie, he starts going buck wild. He starts doing all of this stuff. And so here in this conversation, there's the Joker and Batman having this conversation, right? And here's what, and here's what's cool about this conversation. The Joker is telling Batman, you're going to have to be the one to take the blame for what Harvey Dent has done. Because if you don't, Harvey Dent is the best thing that Gotham has going for it. And if you don't, Harvey Dent's reputation is going to be ruined. His integrity is going to be challenged. And if, if evil can change the heart of good old Harvey Dent, then Gotham doesn't have a chance. And so here is when Batman became the Dark Knight. Not because of anything he did wrong. Batman hadn't committed any crimes. He hadn't murdered anybody. He hadn't did anything wrong. But this is what Batman says to, to um, the Joker in that conversation. When he was telling him, you're going to have to become the Dark Knight. You're going to have to become the Fall Guy. And he says, I am willing to be whatever Gotham needs me to be. And so here we're reminded of Jesus who was willing to go to the cross on your behalf, not because of anything that he was willing to do. He became sin. He who, who knew no sin became sin. He took all of our struggles, our skepticism, our pain, our abuses, our addictions, our abandonments, all of the broken promises, the lies, everything. He taken all of that to the cross for us, and he willingly paid the price, even though his followers didn't understand it, and even though today we're still trying to figure out what that totally implies. And so I want you all to leave this room tonight as the future leaders of God's church and the future leaders in the world. I want you to leave knowing that Jesus is, in fact, a leader that's worth following. All right, y'all, I'm way out of time. God bless y'all. Woo! <laughs>